Welcome to Module 5.1. In this module, we're going to be discussing the central dogma of molecular biology. But before we get into that, we are going to talk about nucleotides, how they make up DNA and RNA, and how DNA replicates itself. So what is the central dogma of molecular biology? That is the idea that DNA is transcribed into RNA, which is translated into proteins. And this process only goes one direction. So the idea here is that the sequence of DNA is a code, and that code is transcribed into a molecule called RNA, which is then translated into proteins. So the structure and function of proteins is all encoded inside our DNA. And that's the big picture of what we're talking about in this module. So let's talk about DNA and RNA first. These are polynucleotide chains. So we have nucleotides that are bonded together into long chains to form either DNA or RNA. And when I say nucleotide, I'm talking about a structure with three distinct um, pieces. First off is the nitrogenous base. This is the um, G, T, A, C, and U that we're all familiar with. We'll get into those in a minute. This is bound to a 5-carbon sugar, is a pentose sugar, and that is bound to a phosphate group. We're going to talk about each one of these um, units in the next slide. So we're going to talk about the nitrogen containing base, the 5 carbon sugar, and the phosphate. So first off, nitrogen containing bases. These are the codes that DNA uses to specify uh, what a protein should look like. So we have five of them. Four of them are used in DNA and four in RNA. So in DNA you have cytosine, thymine, adenine, and guanine, and in RNA you replace thymine with uracil. These are split into two types of bases. The first is pyrimidines, and the second is purines. The purines are adenine and guanine. The pyrimidines are cytosine, thymine, and uracil. Next off is our 5-carbon sugar. This is a pentose. Uh, there are two types uh, based on whether we're talking about RNA or DNA. RNA is ribonucleic acid, and DNA is deoxyribonucleic acid. So the only difference in the 5-carbon sugars is on the 2-prime carbon here. So when we're talking about carbons inside the sugar, we label them starting with this carbon moving in a clockwise fashion as 1 prime, 2 prime, 3 prime, 4 prime, and 5 prime. So again, we start over here at 1, move in a clockwise fashion, and we'll designate each carbon with 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5 prime. This is very important, as you'll see in the next couple of slides. But the difference between RNA and DNA is here at the 2 carbon. You see we have an X in this image. If that X is a hydrogen, then it's deoxyribose, which is DNA. And if that X is a hydroxyl group, then that is ribonucleic acid, and that is RNA. So the difference between DNA and RNA in this sugar is simply one oxygen on the two prime carbon. And the final component of our nucleic acid is a phosphate group, shown here. This is a negatively charged group that sits on the five prime carbon of the sugar. Again, remember, we labeled them starting here at one, two, three, four, Five. So this is our 5' prime carbon and is connected to our phosphate group. So what does DNA look like when you join these nucleotides together? Well, it looks like this over here on the right. Here you see the two ways that our bases can bond together. You always have G or guanine binding to C, cytosine, and you always have thymine, T, bonding to adenine, A. So the rules of DNA are as, 
A binds to T and to G binds to C. And they do so through hydrogen bonds. These are these dashed lines here. So you can see that we have a hydrogen bond between a hydrogen connected to an electronegative element and another electronegative element. And these line up so that only G and C bind together and only T and A bind together. Now that's the middle of the molecule shown here on the left in figure A. These are called base pairs. That's your A's, T's, G's, and C's. But the outside of the molecule is called our sugar phosphate backbone. Remember we said there are three different parts to our nucleic acid. Our bases are in the middle and the outside backbone of the DNA molecule is composed of our five carbon pentose sugar and our phosphate groups. So the bonds that hold our strands together are here and these are called phosphodiester bonds. These occur between the five prime carbon of one pentose. You can see the five prime carbon of the pentose here and the three prime carbon of the next pentose in line. So DNA has a polarity. There is a five prime end to DNA and a three prime end. A three prime end has a free hydroxyl group on the three prime carbon and the five prime end has a uh, phosphate group here on the five prime carbon. So you can always tell which direction a DNA is going by looking at what fr which carbon is free. So we'll say DNA is running 5 prime to 3 prime or 3 prime to 5 prime. This is a common way in which we tell the chemical polarity of DNA. So these strands are anti-parallel. In other words, the strand here on the left is running from 5 prime to 3 prime downward, which means the other strand is running 5 prime to 3 prime upward. And this is the case the two strands of DNA that bind together to form our double helix are always running in opposite directions. This is why we call them anti-parallel bonds, excuse me, anti-parallel chains, and they form this nice right-handed double helix that we're all used to seeing. So as I was saying, A always bonds to T, so the ratio of A to T is always 1 and G always binds to C, so that ratio is always 1. And these base pairs are again bound together by hydrogen bonds here. The, bo the chains run anti-parallel, 5 prime to 3 prime and 3 prime to 5 prime. And each strand contains a sequence of nucleotides that is exactly complementary to the nucleotide sequence of its partner strand. So if I were to split this DNA in, in half, and I only gave you half of this strand, it'd be a very simple puzzle to solve because if you only saw thymine here and guanine here, you know by the rules of DNA binding how the other strand looks. Thymine always binds to adenine, guanine is always binding to cytosine, so half a DNA strand essentially carries all the information necessary to form the other strand because we know the rules of how these base pairs bind together. So that's the structure of DNA on a very small scale, the DNA double helix. However, inside our bodies we have 6.5 feet of DNA packed into each cell's tiny 5 micron nucleus. This is the equivalent of folding 24 miles of fine thread into the inside of a tennis ball. So we need a strategy to compact all this DNA into a small area. And this is how that's done. The first unit of compaction is taking our double helix and making what's called a nucleosome. Nucleosome is shown here. A nucleosome is DNA wrapped around a histone. Histone is a positively charged protein that binds tightly to the negatively charged sugar phosphate backbone of DNA. If you'll recall, on the outside of DNA we have these phosphate groups these are negatively charged, so they're going to be attracted to this positively charged histone protein. So DNA folded around a histone protein is called a nucleosome. Next, when you take those nucleosomes and start wrapping them together and coiling them, we call that a chromatin fiber. So nucleosomes bound and wrapped tightly together are chromatin. This chromatin further coils and condenses until we see this X shape that we're quite familiar with called a chromosome.
A chrome, we have 24 types of chromosomes, two copies of each chromosome, except of course for our germ cells, which only have one. So that's 46 chromosomes total. Our chromosomes are duplicates of each other, except of course in males, in which we have an X and Y chromosome instead of two X chromosomes as a female does. So that concludes our lecture on DNA and RNA structure. In our next video, we're going to talk about DNA replication.